Morning San Antonio starts right now. Good morning to you. It's Thursday, September 29th. Thanks for joining us. We hope you had a good week, almost Friday. We're going to get to traffic in just a bit, but let's go over and head over to Justin with the latest on Ian. Yeah, we've been tracking Ian, of course, all night long and moved through Florida, dumped a lot of heavy rain. We're starting to see some of these totals and they are huge, 15 to 20 inches in some cases. We're starting to see some of the damage and we're going to have more on that in just a second. First, let's get some of the statistics here as we look at Ian as uh, it crosses over the state of Florida. And uh, you can see that uh, we've got quite a bit of rain still going on, and this is going to eventually work its way up the coast and move up into the Carolinas. Uh, we've also uh, got some information coming out of northeastern Florida, and reporter Ashley Harding is in St. Augustine with more there. We are in the Davis Shores community of St. Johns County. I want to go ahead and show you that flooding is already starting to become an issue where we're standing. This is Flagler and Arredondo. This is a neighborhood that has notorious flooding and has for several years. But you can see almost the entire intersection is underwater. They are from this direction, this direction, this direction. Where you're looking right now, that is Anastasia. That is the main road that is used to get to the Bridge of Lions and get into the city of St. Augustine. It is definitely a concern. We've shown our viewers over the years how this area, people who live in this neighborhood, were impacted by Hurricanes Matthew and Irma. And they also sometimes see this with a heavy rain. But with Ian, the effects of it, now we're seeing this. And also you see someone who's driving through. Typically you were told not to drive through standing water because that can be bad for your vehicle. But you can see flooding is starting to happen here in St. John's County. And this is the first that we've seen of it. Of course, we're going to be here and keep everyone updated. We will keep you posted. But reporting in St. John's County, Ashley Harding, Channel 4, the local station. Back to you. Ashley, thank you. And you can see that heavy rain that is pouring on the uh, east coast of Florida now. Some pretty heavy rain around Jacksonville, where she was reporting from. And they'll see that throughout the day. So the west side of Florida, where they had all the wind and the storm surge yesterday, it is starting to quiet down. But of course, there will be a lot of damage and they're still getting uh, power lines back online and those sort of things. So the cleanup's going to take probably at least a week there, if not more. Well, let's get you the latest stats on Tropical Storm Ian now. And winds are at uh, 65 miles per hour, so it is a tropical storm. It moves north, eventually affecting South Carolina. So it reemerges out over the Atlantic and then strengthens maybe a little bit. And by tomorrow afternoon, it's likely making landfall again somewhere around South Carolina and then moving up uh, to places like Charlotte, where they could get some heavy rain out of this as well. That'll occur over the weekend. Meantime, back home, we had a great start, yet another great start. Temperatures in the 50s and 60s, 60 degrees here in San Antonio this morning. And we'll see those numbers top out near 90 again this afternoon. There are some football games tonight. This is great football weather. Very comfortable. Sunsets around 722. By halftime, we're in the mid to upper 70s. Very nice for Thursday night football. It'll be nice for Friday night football, too. We've got a little bit of a change in the weekend forecast. We're going to talk more about that here in just a couple minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. We do want to mention that we will be hosting another phone bank on Monday in partnership with the Red Cross to raise money for relief efforts in Florida. The phone lines will be open from noon to 7 p.m. on Monday, and we will release that number to call on that day. Our top story this morning, a man was hit and killed by a car on Highway 281 near the airport at Sunset Road early this morning. Katrina Weber is there and tells us why this may be a death with no charges filed. Well, right now, it seems that San Antonio police is still trying to gather all the facts. We've seen them out here on the highway taking measurements, also talking to a couple of drivers. One of those appears to be the driver who was involved in this crash. We saw him being consoled by a woman who told me she was his wife. She says she got a call from him around 6 this morning saying that he had been involved in an accident, that a man darted across the highway and he was not able to stop. Traffic investigators have been working for hours in the area near a tarp that appears to be covering up a body. And the southbound lanes of Highway 281 are shut down in the meantime. But so far, we have had no official word from San Antonio police. We are not able to cross the highway and get to any of those officers just yet. Reporting from the north side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News.
All right, thank you, Katrina. Stay safe out there. And that investigation does continue. Let's get a look at 281 at Sprucewood. Not a lot has changed out there, unfortunately. Of course, we know this investigation could take a while, and sometimes these scenes do take a while to also clear up, which would obviously lead to some big backups. And that's really what we've been seeing for the last several hours. This crash uh, was reported sometime after 6 this morning, now into hour 3 of this mess out there along 281. And you can see that uh, drivers are making their way along the access road just fine. But you're going to see some problems out there due to that closure. 281 southbound is going to be seeing the impact there between Jones Maltzberger Road and Loop 410, and that's where that area is shaded out on our map. So we have that indicated as a place you want to avoid. If you're traveling down 410 east, trying to get on a 281 south, you'll also have some problems there as well. So look for different routes. But here's one I want to mention to you really quick. If you are still in the southbound lanes, you're planning to travel through there in the next few minutes or so, Easy solution here. Exit Bitters Road and turn right uh, and then get onto West Avenue. I've outlined it in blue and you'll continue a little bit further down on West Avenue. Turn left at Blanco Road and you'll be able to get onto 281 southbound that way. So just one of the solutions I've been combing through. But as we give you a quick look at the map, you can see that a lot of the slowdowns have also dwindled down. So that's better news out there for other drivers in other parts of the city. But the big problem will still be here along 281. Not clear how long it's going to take this uh, to be cleared up, but we're going to watch it closely and have those updates for you as long as you need them guys. Thank you, Stephen. Another crash early this morning. San Antonio police are still searching for the driver involved in it that happened on Pecan Grove. This is not far from East South Cross. This is on the city's southeast side. Police say a caller heard the crash and then saw a car on fire. They say it looks like the driver took out at least one brick mailbox before the car burst into flames. When officers got to the scene, the driver was gone. Right now, there have not been any reports of injuries. And let's look at today's 9 at 9. Russia is getting closer to declaring parts of Ukraine as its own, and the flood of people trying to leave Russia continues. The White House says it's preparing to add new sanctions on Russia and is expected to give Ukraine another $1 billion worth of weapons and equipment as the war goes on. Congress is rushing to avoid a federal government shutdown. Both chambers have to pass a funding bill, and President Biden has to sign it by tomorrow's deadline. The good news is both parties seem optimistic. 72 senators supported a proposal during a routine vote on Tuesday. Even if lawmakers pass the current plan, they will only fund the government until December 16th. The Justice Department is asking for more time from the special master overseeing the Mar-a-Lago FBI raid. The DOJ is trying to push back temporary deadlines because they haven't found a vendor from the government to review the documents taken from former President Donald Trump's home. They say they're confident one will eventually accept the job. The House Select Committee investigating the Capitol attack will interview Jenny Thomas this week. She is the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Members of the panel have been wanting to talk to her because she was reportedly texting with Mark Meadows before the attack about overturning the election. However, she has insisted that her personal views and her husband's professional life are kept separate. Rapper Coolio died yesterday afternoon. He was only 59 years old. It's unclear what led to his death, but officials say paramedics were called out to a home in Los Angeles for a medical emergency. And then when they got there, they pronounced the rapper dead. Coolio lit up the music charts in the 1990s with hits like Gangsta's Paradise and Fantastic Voyage. The FDA is expected to authorize updated COVID booster shots for young children as soon as next month. The booster is supposed to target the original COVID strain, as well as the Omicron subvariants, just like the boosters that became available for older people earlier this month. FDA officials are working on new standards that foods have to meet in order to be labeled as healthy. The original claim started in 1994 and hasn't been updated until now. The FDA says a lot has changed since then, and the standards to meet the healthy claim need to change too. They'll now consider all of the nutrients in foods not just certain ones. Amazon is offering a new device to help you track your sleep. The new Halo Rise is a bedside device that Amazon says can sense how you're sleeping without using cameras or microphones. It will also help wake you up with music and lights that simulate a sunrise. The Halo Rise will be available later this year for $140. Apple is cutting back on making more of the iPhone 14 because of low demand. That's according to a Bloomberg report. So far, Apple hasn't commented on that. 
The iPhone 14 went on sale earlier this month, but people have not been rushing to buy it. And that's today's nine at nine. Eight minutes past the hour, 70 degrees. And we are getting closer to the annual Light the Night Walk. It is an event put on by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, which is dedicated to curing blood cancers. He informed me that this is what it is and that he does have leukemia and that we basically needed to start treatment immediately. So, of course, I broke down into tears. Max Massey spoke with this woman and her son, who is the honored hero at this year's event. She tells us about the young boy's fight with leukemia and what's next for him now that he has stopped chemo and is almost done with his treatments. Plus, a new program is showing students how to use film equipment, write scripts, and even act. A look at how local professionals in the film industry are getting involved coming up next. There is a new media arts program giving high school students the opportunity to learn about filmmaking. Tiffany Huetas joins us live from the Alamo City Studios where students are learning from local seasoned professionals in the industry. Good morning. The program kicked off with 24 students, high school students. To talk a little bit more about this, we have G. Wayne and Kat this morning, the instructors of this program. Talk to us a little bit about your background and what you're going to bring. Well, I am a NAACP award-winning director. Uh, I have a film uh, called Policing uh, on Tubi, plug. Uh, also have been doing directing for several years and was excited when they asked me to be part of it to help teach editing to the students. And Kat, talk to us about you. Uh, I've been a professional actor for 20 years and a lot of teaching experience as well. So I still am working in the industry. You can catch me on HBO and Hulu and um, IMDb and all that jazz. But I'm so excited to be working with these talented students and to give them life skills as well as acting skills because acting so much relates to your own emotional intelligence and how you process emotions. So it's been a joy to work with these talented kids. Talk to us about this program. What does it entail? Uh, the program entails everything to come with content creation. Uh, it's being taught by the top filmmakers uh, within the city. Uh, content creation would include, you know, things from production, writing, acting, editing, and all the way to even marketing their products. And how was this made possible? A lot of people were involved. Yes, a lot of people were involved, but the amount of support that we've received from Councilman Jalen, not only in pioneering getting this program launched, um, but also everything he does for District 2, it's been incredible. So thank you so much. And uh, everyone at Elmo City Studios has been instrumental in creating the space that can make this program possible. What type of impact do you think this program is going to have in our community? I think it's huge. Um, when I was a kid, you know, I wanted to get into filmmaking, but I didn't have the resources around to go to. And especially growing up on the east side, it's not like there's a whole lot of options for us. So now that this program is here and it's free for the students, it's something that I think is going to benefit all of them for years to come and let them know if they really want to get into filmmaking or where they want to go with their life and the path they want to choose. And there's going to be a showcase where people can watch all of this. Talk to us about that, Kat. Absolutely. Uh, the six-week program will culminate in a showcase. Uh, it's November 20th at the Carver Center. You can find out more information. Uh, we're very hopeful, actually, to create a summer program after this. So if you are interested in your high school student, go to www.alamocitystudios.com slash EYCCP. There'll be more information on the showcase November 20th, and you can fill out an application if you are a student you know would be interested in doing a future summer program. Awesome. Well, I have a feeling they're going to have a blast in this program, and we're going to have more details on KSAT.com and the noon show. And then we might see one of these students at KSAT a few years from now. You never know. Back to you. Sounds awesome. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, while Florida is being inundated by too much rain, Justin Horn is here with more on how long it's been since we've seen measurable precipitation here in South Texas. Going on three weeks now, guys, and this year has just been, I mean, awful when it comes to rainfall. Year to date, this is the driest we've ever seen, uh, and there's not a lot of rain in the forecast. They start off with negative news, but that's just where we are. And you look across the country, and there is very little going on. Kind of the one show in town, so to speak, is down there in Florida with Ian. Uh, the rest of the country is just dealing with 
quiet conditions, and that certainly is the case here in Texas. So let's zoom in here on Florida, and we'll show you, Ian, now it's starting to reemerge okay. out into the Atlantic. Still some very heavy rain on the north side of the storm, so Daytona Beach up to Jacksonville. That's where the very heavy rain is going to be here over the next several hours, and there likely will be some flooding up and down the 95 I-95 corridor there. As we look at the observed rainfall over the last 24 hours, these numbers are huge, 15 to 20 inches of rain. So that's going to cause flooding for sure around the Orlando area, Daytona Beach down to south of Tampa, of course, where that hurricane made landfall yesterday. That's where there is a lot of flooding, but you have to keep in mind there's also damage, storm surge. I mean, uh, the western part of Florida here is kind of in shambles, especially south of Tampa, unfortunately, with the uh, damage from Ian. And as we look at the path here, as it does reemerge, there could be a little bit of strengthening with this. Winds right now are at 65 miles per hour, gusting to 75. So again, it is a tropical storm. As it moves north, and this happens tomorrow afternoon, it will make landfall again somewhere around South Carolina, we think. Uh, winds 70 miles per hour. So that's close to hurricane strength, and there will be more storm surge here in the lowlands of South Carolina. And then this moves north, producing heavy rain along the way as we head into the weekend. For us, we've got clear skies and another beautiful start. 70 degrees at the airport. Dew point is at 52, so that number's up slightly, but it falls again this afternoon. We've got calm winds. 62 in Fredericksburg, 61 Kerrville, 67 Hondo, 67 Pleasanton, 71 right now in Catula, and starting to see some 70s here around the city. And you'll see those numbers rise pretty quickly again today with fairly dry air in place. Again, these dew points have come up just a little bit, but we'll get another shot of drier air coming in tomorrow. So these dew points never really get to the point where you'll feel it. Here's the case at 12 hour forecast. 84 degrees by noontime, 90 by 3 p.m., 91 4 o'clock, and by 5 p.m. we're at 91. So fairly hot this afternoon, but as I said, those uh, Thursday night football games, once the sun goes down, it'll feel really nice outside. I want to talk about the big picture here. We've got some tropical connections. Of course, we, we mentioned Ian. On the back side of this, there is a lot of dry air, and that's that dry air I was talking about that arrives tomorrow into the weekend. So that's at the surface. That keeps, keeps things really pretty quiet, and most of the country, by the way, dealing with this dry air. But in the Pacific, we have a new tropical storm. That's Orlean. This is likely going to strengthen into a hurricane, and it starts to move a little bit more northeast as we head into the weekend. That spreads some upper level moisture over top of us. So I think we're going to start to get some high clouds Sunday into Monday. The unfortunate part about this is a lot of times with these Pacific hurricanes, we can get some rain out of it. It will squeeze some moisture out. But because it's so dry at the surface, this is just going to be upper level moisture, meaning we're just going to get clouds, no rain out of it. But with the clouds in place Sunday, Monday, if they do indeed thicken up a little bit, we can see temperatures come down some. 89 degrees Friday, 89 Saturday. We'll drop temperatures a little bit. 88 Sunday, 86 on Monday. We'll call it partly to mostly cloudy with those clouds overhead. And then uh, 87 Tuesday, 88 Wednesday. So these temperatures really aren't bad. The mornings are fantastic. The evenings are great. It's just this lack of rainfall that is really causing a lot of issues in if we continue forward, our drought's going to start getting much, much worse again, guys. You got it. We'll keep an eye on it, Justin. Yep. Thank you. 919, 70 degrees. And we are counting down to the Light the Night Walk next Saturday. Light the Night actually like signifies that we are done <laughs> for me. This mother is ready to celebrate the end of treatment for her young son who was diagnosed with leukemia. She shares the journey her and her son have been on over the past two years and what they are looking forward to. 923 on your Thursday morning the annual light the night event is next Saturday and this morning we get to meet the young boy who's being honored the honored hero at the walk. Max Massey spoke with seven year old Jarvis Henderson and his mom about his fight with leukemia and what comes next for him. I was thinking about like making like a robot that is called helper robot or something. Meet Jarvis Henderson. Jarvis is an energetic seven year old who tells me he wants to grow up to be a scientist and an inventor and speaking with Jarvis. You'd never know what the last two years has been like for him and his family. I just broke into tears. At the age of just five years old, Jarvis was diagnosed with cancer. He informed me that this is what it is and that he does have leukemia. 
and that we basically needed to start treatment immediately. So, of course, I broke down into tears. Um, I don't think Jarvis knew exactly what was going on at the time. He just knew he was in pain. Jarvis's mother, Paula, tells me it was a shock to everyone. And if fighting pediatric cancer wasn't hard enough, it was right as the pandemic was sweeping the nation. It was literally me uh, and Jarvis, and uh, we were quarantined at first because they didn't know if he could have possibly had COVID because of his fevers. So the family stuck together and battled. Lots of doctor's visits, lots of lumbar punctures, lots of chemo, limited activities, fluctuation of weight, uh, weight gain, weight loss. And at the end of a long, draining journey, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Chemo stopped in June, June, July. Um, so we're done. We actually get to ring the bell um, for the completed treatments October 1st. So we're excited. Paula now has a special place in her heart for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. They helped her and helped Jarvis through this tough, tough road. At that time, I actually had to leave my job. So uh, the funds that were given to me during that time helped with rent, food, things of that, things like that. So it was a big help to our family to be able to have the LLS program to help us out. Now with the light the night right around the corner, it truly is a special symbol. Light the night actually like signifies that we are done <laughs> for me. Paula says light the night is happening during the time when Jarvis is actually finishing his treatment. And for him to be honored at the event, it is so special. As for seven-year-old Jarvis, he's so excited about what comes next. Baseball. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Light the Night is next Saturday, October 8th at Hemisphere here in San Antonio. You can join our team right now by scanning the QR code on your screen. And you can also find more information about the walk on our website at kset.com. 926, 73 degrees. And there's still a lot more ahead on GMSA at 9, including a check-in with David Sears on the morning headlines. The big incident this morning uh, has been southbound 281 near the airport. Uh, we're right now looking live at 410 in Parambital. And there's 281 at St. Mary's. Traffic looks great here closer to downtown. And we've still got those big problems. 281 at Loop 410 on the north side. And welcome back. It is 929. Looking out there with live cam, it's beautiful out there. Definitely a good time to step outside at 73 degrees. Yeah, it feels good and the dogs are loving it. We've been showing you Fido's forecast. We've got another one for you this morning. Really most of today, is a good dog walking day. So forecast here is irrelevant. It's the picture that we want to look at because, you know, blue is super cute. And it says blue is always the first one ready for breakfast in the morning. Same. I'm right there with you, buddy. Uh, great picture. Thank you so much for sending that in. And as I said, most of today will be just fine for getting out and walking the dog. It does get a little warm this afternoon. We're up around 91, but that's still not bad. Sunny skies, dry air looks good. As uh, we take a look at the air quality, it is in the unhealthy category for those who are sensitive uh, to that kind of thing. We do have an ozone action day in place today with some higher levels of ozone. I uh, just want to pass that along. The pollen count, molds are moderate, ragweed is moderate. Molds are down from yesterday, but still, uh, still slightly elevated, and ragweed's been up for most of the week. Pigweed is low at 10. And let's look ahead to the weekend because we're almost there. Mostly sunny Saturday, 89. We will see some more clouds on Sunday, 88 degrees, and no rain in the forecast. So great for any outdoor plans that you may have, guys. Justin, thank you. Other news this morning, two people are dead. Ten others are injured after a crash involving undocumented migrants in Uvalde late yesterday. Uvalde police say Border Patrol spotted a black truck speeding on Highway 90. They say the truck then crashed into an 18 wheeler and another vehicle near Uvalde's downtown plaza. The injured and the dead were all inside of the black truck. The other drivers are OK. Uvalde Police Chief Daniel Rodriguez says incidents like this one involving undocumented migrants happen all the time in Uvalde. The status of that driver is unknown. About two hours west of San Antonio is Kenny County, and they are feeling the effects of human smuggling. The sheriff there tells our Lee Waldman he has never seen anything like it. Here they go. 
out of the truck, out of the front seat, out of the back seat, out of the bed. She's got him. They're still coming out of the truck. It's scenes like this one that are becoming all too common in Kitty County. Somewhere between 530 and now we've had three or four smuggling cases plus a pursuit and it just doesn't end. Sheriff Brad Coe has led the department of okay. six full-time deputies for six years. Prior to that, he was with Border Patrol for over three decades. If we were catching one or two smuggling, human smuggling loads a month, we were, we thought we were doing good. Now we're up to catching 50 or 60 smugglers a month. In July, that number peaked at 75. But if we're catching 75 a month, how many are getting through? Because they just keep coming. At the heart of Kinney County is Brackettville, a two stoplight town. Poe's mission is to keep as much of the smuggling outside of town as possible. The last one we had that came through town, I did everything I could to hit that cart to, to stop him from being in town. He drove us around, pointing out the school. The boulders are a new addition. In the event of a bailout, they're there to try to keep the vehicles from going into the school. Driving with Sheriff Coe, we saw this woman being arrested for human smuggling. This was at 9.08 a.m. By 2.08 p.m., we saw her walking along the highway. We don't know the circumstances of her release, but the sheriff says female smugglers present a whole new set of problems for the county. Very few places that will accept females. Well, we got that worked out. We've, we've contracted with a couple of counties around us to handle females. Now we're seeing it pregnant females because pregnant females, nobody takes pregnant females. There's a darker side. The heat proving to be fatal. The number of calls for bodies found on ranch land is skyrocketing. Last year was 17. So far this year, we're up to nine. The year's not over yet. For the last 18 months, KCSO has been working with Operation Lone Star and Operation Stone Garden. They help the department with funding and equipment, but with the current increase in smuggling, it's not a pace they can keep up with. So we just got to see how long, how long we can sustain it, but we can't sustain it forever. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. And Sheriff Coe says they will get their next round of funding from Operation Lone Star in mid-October. Tonight on the Night Beat, we're going to show you how this is impacting landowners and business owners around Kinney County. In more headlines, Lizzo has a talent rarely seen as she showed off playing a musical instrument, instrument rarely seen. Plus, Hocus Pocus Poof imagine spending the night in the famous house from the movie. David Sears is here to explain all this. Well, hey there, David. Kind of creepy look in this house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it kind it of is. is. Right of Justin's alley. He likes those kind of houses, I think. <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> He'll spend the night in one of those things. He's not scared. <laughs> oh, right? he is brave. We'll show to you in just a second, but first, she is a pop star, a Grammy award-winning singer, songwriter, and rapper, and oh yeah, she is an accomplished flutist. We're talking about Liz. <laughs> That is Lizzo playing a 200-year-old crystal flute. Please don't drop it. She was on a concert stop in D.C., took time out to visit the Library of Congress where the flute is being preserved. The flute was designed and made by Claude Laurent, a famous flute maker. He gifted the delicate woodwind to former President James Madison back in 1813. The librarian not only let Lizzo play it during her visit to the hall, but she also brought it out on stage during her concert and let her play a few notes. Lizzo said it was like playing out of a glass, a wine glass. Now, if you are a coffee drinker or thinking about becoming one, go ahead and drink up. A new study says two or three cups a day could lead to a longer life. The study was published in the European Journal of Preventative Cardiology. The study tells us that people who drink coffee had a chance at a longer life because of a lower risk of heart disease. That is compared to people who don't drink coffee. The study had 449,000 involved. Their ages were between 40 and 60. It really didn't matter how you had your coffee, ground, instant, or decaffeinated. The research also shows that those who drank four or five cups a day of ground coffee or those who had two or three cups on instant coffee were at a lower risk. Take you to the French Alps. That is a couple of hang gliders and they're playing pool up there. Fortunately, neither one of them ended up behind the eight ball. It worked out, still kind of weird, but then again, the whole event is kind of weird. <laughs> it is made up of folks who add a little something to their hang gliders, paragliders, and wingsuits. Believe it or not, they've been doing this for 49 years. Not only fun for participants, but it helps the local economy take flight because the area soars with tourists. All right, do you remember the movie Hocus Pocus? I think I got this about right. It's about teenagers ending up in a house. They end up freeing the evil witches. And a magical cat helps the teenagers steal a book of spells so they can keep the witches from becoming immortal. 
Well, this is the house. It's the Sanderson House, deep in the woods of Salem, Massachusetts, and it is available as an Airbnb. Really creepy looking, don't you think? Guests can try performing some of those enchantments from the Book of Spells. Two guests can get an exclusive stay for just $31. The listing opens up October 12th at 1 p.m. The house was recreated for Hocus Pocus 2. And that starts streaming tomorrow on Disney+. A lot of people talking about that. Yeah, so, yeah. it'll be fun to so. see this after 30 years. Mm -hmm. But the house looked kind of creepy. Yeah, it is. It is in the movie as well. Well, at least I haven't seen the second one, but, the, you know, the first one. But it's for kids, so it can't be that scary. Mm, it's kind of scary. <laughs> okay. right. Thank, thank, thank you, David. David. 937, 74 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. And if you're a fan of the buy now, pay later service, there might be some new rules heading your way. Why the service is raising some concerns among federal regulators. In almost every culture, the transition of a girl into womanhood is a very important event. In the Hispanic culture, that is marked with the quinceanera. It's believed the quinceanera tradition started when the Spanish colonized Mexico, but others say its origins began with the Aztecs. Today, the quinceanera is celebrated all throughout the United States, Mexico, Central, and South America. The coordination of the event is a team effort with family and friends sponsoring different parts of the celebration. The quinceanera starts with a mass, then followed by a dinner and dance. At the reception, the young girl is dressed in a beautiful ball gown with a tiara and is presented with her last doll, a cross, and Bible. All the things she will need as she moves from girlhood into womanhood. Hey, remember Layaway? Well, now an online payment service called Buy Now, Pay Later is gaining both in popularity and some concerns. The service allows you to pay for items and installments, and now federal regulators are considering stricter rules. In today's Consumer Watch, why a new report has both economists and experts worried. Buy now, pay later. It's an increasingly popular online payment option, but it's also gaining the attention of federal regulators and raising concerns from some economists. I think buy now, pay later should be more highly regulated. The services, which allow you to pay for items and installments, could soon face stricter rules. A recent report from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau found the services are financially risky for consumers and should be regulated more like credit card companies. Economist Mark Zandi agrees and says those types of loans are often going to hard-pressed, low-income households. They're particularly vulnerable and in many cases don't have the same kind of financial understanding that they might need to be able to really evaluate whether this is a good good uh, arrangement for them or not. According to the report, Americans took out more than $24 billion in loans on buy now, pay later programs in 2021. That's up from only $2 billion in 2019. Financial experts warn you could rack up debt you can't afford to pay back because the services encourage you to buy extravagant items that you previously wouldn't be able to buy. When you're shopping online, you want a dress, you need a dress, but oh, you see this jacket and oh, you see something else. The next thing you know, you spent more because you can pay it over time. Most buy now, pay later companies charge late fees or start charging interest if you don't make payments on time. And missed payments may lead to them freezing your account and your debt could be turned over to a debt collector. And sometimes those late payments are reported, which could impact credit score. If you're not careful, you'll end up having a lot of these buy now, pay later contracts for stuff that you really don't need. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Cole Higgins. 944 and just in, we have a drought update from our Justin Horn. Mm -hmm. We get these in on Thursdays and it always kind of paints the picture right of where we stand. And I don't think it comes as any surprise that the drought is starting to settle back in. So this was last week's drought monitor. So we can compare it to this week's and we'll go to this week and there you go. Not much change, but I will say North uh, Northeast Bear County now included within that exceptional drought. That's as bad as it gets. New Braunfels, Seguin, San Antonio, Bear County. This has been an area that's been hit pretty hard by lack of rainfall right in here. You go west into the hill country. There's been some good rains over the last couple of months that have helped out. So the drought is kind of centered right there along the I-35 corridor. And as we look at uh, Medina Lake, still in bad shape. 7.5% full, it's still falling over the last three months. It's down 12.9 feet. 
And as we go outside for you and we look at the time lapse, it was a nice morning, a busy morning commute, but a nice morning. And we've had clear skies uh, really for the last couple of days, and that uh, will stay in place through probably Saturday before we start to see a little bit more cloud cover. 70 degrees at the airport right now, calm winds, humidity is at 53%. That's still pretty low. And you look at the dew points, they're up a little bit today, maybe up into the low 50s, but these numbers drop off again, especially as we head into the weekend. Uh, so from Friday, where we have dew points in the 40s, they'll fall off into the mid 40s, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So the air stays relatively dry. And as long as we have dew points like that, rain is not going to be in the picture. Big swing in temperatures today, just like yesterday with that dry air, 60 in the morning. We make it up to 91 during the afternoon. So if you're out in the sun, it's going to feel pretty warm, but in the shade it feels okay because of that dry air and the evenings will be nice too. 31 degree swing today. Here's a look at the high temperatures around the area. As high as 92 in places like Somerset, Elmendorf, Divine, 92 in Seguin, 92 in New Braunfels, but 80s for places like Bernie, Kerrville, and Bandera. Let's take you out to Florida and show you Ian. Once again, winds are at 65 miles per hour, gusting to 75. It does look like this has now reemerged out into the Atlantic. If it's not, it's very, very close. And as it uh, moves out over open water again, there could be a little bit of strengthening, although conditions aren't great for that. And as we look at the track, this moves up towards South Carolina as a tropical storm, high end tropical storm, winds at 70 miles per hour, and then moves inland and produces quite a bit of rain in places like Charlotte and western parts of North Carolina. Uh, before finally weakening and falling apart. Your next question may be, well, what else is out there? Is this it? Is Ian the last we're going to see of this tropical season? Well, it certainly isn't over. Uh, we still have a lot of time left in this tropical season. And you see Ian there, but as we go out into the Atlantic, there's a new tropical depression, number 11. Good news with this, we don't have to worry about it. Looks like it'll stay weak, probably stays out over the open ocean. Uh, meantime, in the Pacific, we do have a new tropical storm, Orlean. This does have some effect on our weather because as it moves north, and now they're thinking this could be a Cat 2 storm, it'll bring some rain to the west coast of Mexico, but it will also throw some clouds in our direction. Looks like it'll stream some high clouds over top of us this weekend. Unfortunately, it doesn't bring us rain. Um, but with a little bit of cloud cover, that'll bring temperatures down some as we get into early next week. So 89 degrees tomorrow, 89 Saturday, 88 Sunday. We add in that extra cloud cover, mostly cloudy, we'll call it Sunday and Monday. And that'll bring temperatures down to maybe the mid 80s on Monday. Morning lows still stay really comfortable. And next week looks nice. It's just rain free. And uh, we're looking down the line. I'm looking at the extended models. I'm not seeing a whole lot of hope there. And good football weather tonight for Thursday oh, night action. Oh, nice. Great football weather. Uh, that'll be the case tomorrow night too. Fantastic. Yep. Well, speaking of. We'd like to take a look at some of the big matchups happening in our area tonight. First up, O'Connor versus Brennan. That's at 7 o'clock over at Ferris Stadium. Sotomayor versus John Jay at 7 p.m. at Gustafson Stadium. And finally, Victoria East at Corpus Christi Miller. 7 o'clock, Buccaneer Stadium. We'll have the highlights for you coming up on the KSAT 12 Night Beat at 10. Yeah, we're happy they'll have good weather to play in. This Absolutely. Time yes, time now, 948 and 75 degrees for now. We'll be right back. Transitioning your traditional lawn of grass to something more sustainable like clover. You may have seen this trend on TikTok, but could it work for San Antonio? I'm Sarah Costa coming up tomorrow on GMSA. Hear from a native plant expert if this could work. And if so, what are the benefits? Thank you, Sarah. 952 right now. A new episode of South Texas Crime Stories is now streaming. This week, it's all about Pauline Diaz. She disappeared nearly 12 years ago after she was seen walking out of a southeast side HEB where she worked. KTH 12 Courtney Friedman discovered her disappearance. She spoke with Erica Hernandez and Lee Waldman about the case. You can list that new episode and the past episode of South Texas Crime Stories by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. It will take you to the full list of all podcast episodes. 
And a reminder, tomorrow, Governor Greg Abbott and his Democratic opponent, Beto O'Rourke, will face off in a debate at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley in Edinburgh. Now, Abbott's campaign says this will be the only debate he will be doing before Election Day. Our Steve Spreester will be one of the moderators at the debate. Debate broadcast right here on KSET beginning at 7 p.m. And it will be live streamed on KSET.com. Election Day is November 8th. The deadline to register to vote is October 11th. This election year is an important one. In addition to the governor's race, voters will also elect uh, Bear County's first new county judge in 20 years. And all 435 seats in the House of Representatives and a third of the U.S. Senate seats are also up for grabs. We have all the information you need to know on KSAT.com. This week is your last chance to take part in our KSAT community food donations at any participating Randolph Brooks Federal Credit Union location. The San Antonio Food Bank and RBFCU have partnered up to collect non-perishable food items for Hunger Action Month. And this is a map here of all the participating locations. You can also find a list of all of these locations on our website at KSAT.com. Donations are accepted through Friday. That's tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can also scan the QR code on your screen. It will take you to our web article with a list of the 12 most wanted food items this month. Some of the items are things like peanut butter, dry cereal, rice, and canned soups. Again, all this information is online. The food drive ends tomorrow. And a quick look at the roads with Trans Guide looking over at 281 at Loop 410. This is a much better situation right now than it was earlier this morning. It had uh, se severe backups. That's right. So we had a major accident that closed down southbound 281 south of 410. That is now cleared. Good news there. This, I think, is a stalled vehicle. And we're also getting reports now of a collision at Loop 410 at Southton Road that has a couple of lanes closed down. Also seeing a disabled vehicle now being reported, I-35 at Tor Topper Wine in the northbound lanes of traffic. But these shots at I-10 looking good and I-35 at Brooklyn. Slow going on yeah, that other side the there. the access road, a little slow That going was that the way. southbound side, yes. if I recall. I don't see that incident right now on any of our maps, but just be advised, slow going here in the downtown area. And as we look at the seven day forecast, uh, you know, we were in the low 70s earlier. We've already jumped up to 77. So we're, we're, we are well on our way to the low 90s this afternoon. Pretty warm, but dry air stays in place. 80s next few days. We will see some more clouds as we get into Sunday and Monday. And by the way, Ian, still a tropical storm starting to move back out into the Atlantic. Uh, we're hosting another phone bank Monday in partnership with the Red Cross to raise money for relief efforts in Florida. Phone lines will be open from noon to 7 on Monday, and we will release the phone number to call that day. We held a phone bank this past Monday for the people of Puerto Rico after Fiona ripped through that island. The final total from the event, $14,045. So thank you to everyone who donated. And we hope for the same or better response for our phone bank on this coming Monday. Absolutely. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day.